and it's my pleasure to be MC for today's online seminar, uh, Development Administration, Human Behavior in the Philippines after the next COVID-19. And today our guest speaker will come to share her experience of COVID-19 situation in Philippines, uh, like what is the main issue and how to uh, how they cope with it, and which can be helpful for us to adapt it in many ways. And before we move on, I would like to invite Associate Professor Dr. Bun Anand Pinay Sap, Director of PhD program in public administration to welcome all of you and please welcome Professor Dr. Bun Anand. Yes, uh, good evening Dr. Rowena Akoba and everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you to the special seminar. Today the topic is about development administration, human behavior, in the Philippines after the next COVID-19 by Dr. Rovina Akoba. As you all know that COVID-19 has sent shockwave through the globe. People are worried about their health, about their life, and uh, many business are closing down. And uh, many policy makers are looking for ways to make the situation better. So this is a good chance for all of us to listen to our guest speaker who is going to share her thought, her view and her experience how the people in the Philippines handle this situation, come up with a good solution. And I believe that uh, everyone in this session can learn and apply it to our situation. And finally, I would like to thank you, Dr. Rovina Akoba, to come and sharing her experience with us. And uh, now I would like to turn the stage to our MC. Okay. Thank you, Professor Dr. Bunanan, for a very warm welcome uh, to begin this seminar, online seminar, uh, Development Administration in the Topic of Human Behavior in the Philippines after the next COVID-19. The seminar will consist of one hour with knowledge sharing from our guest speaker, and another 30 minutes will be question and answer part. And today we are pleased to have Dr. Rowena Alcoba as our guest speaker. Uh, Dr. Rowena graduate bachelor degree of art major in economic from Koleyo Design Wandile Tran University and master degree in management technology from De La Salle University and doctoral degree in development administration from NIDA and she has a distinguished career as a lecturer in various universities. She has taught courses that include development administration, business research, uh, sustainable business development and a few authors and recently uh, she is a lecturer at uh, Chiang Mai Rajapat University International College. Uh, she also has many academic publications and today she has come to share some important knowledge with us. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Rowena Alcoba. Thank you everyone. Um, good afternoon, Professor Bunanan. Good afternoon, dear participants. Um, first, I would like to thank Professor Bunanan for this uh, invitation to speak to you today. I am very honored for this opportunity. And um, I also would like to thank this audience for your time and attention. So um, let me share my slide with you. and sharing. Um, can I share it in like um, slide form? Okay, well, you you open your slide first and then you go to the, on your top, top right, the arrow up, share. Yeah, I'm there. there. Okay, it works. 
Uh, it doesn't share as a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, let's see this. It should. It's coming. They eat last year. Oh. All right. So can you see the slide that I'm sharing yes. right now? Um, is it OK yes. if I turn off my camera so you can just focus on the slide? Oh, yes. All right. OK, so um, I know that our um, MC, our host, already gave a very nice introduction of me. But let me also introduce myself to you. I'm Rowena Alcoba from the Philippines. I've been here in Thailand for almost 20 years now, so two decades. And as mentioned, I am an alumna of NIDA. I graduated in 2019 with a doctoral degree in development administration. I am currently a lecturer at Chiang Mai Rajabat University and also an adjunct faculty at St. Robert's Global Education, teaching masters and doctoral students. I moved here in Chiang Mai after more than a decade of working at the Asian Institute of Technology in Bangkok. In AIT, I held various positions such as senior program officer and learning portfolio manager and work in the areas of professional education and capacity building. My research interests are in the areas of public service motivation, organizational politics, social entrepreneurship, and internationalization of higher education. Now, to start, I would like to throw you this question. What are the new habits that you pick up during the pandemic? It could be, you know, value or attitudes or behavior that you develop in the course of the health crisis in the past two years. Anyone can answer? So many things that I do mostly is online right now, um, like online learning, online banking, and so on. Mm -hmm. So are you saying you develop new technological skills? Or you adopted, you know, you became uh, more familiar with using digital technology? Yes, like I uh, can use like application uh, to help not only for studying, but also for working, communicating with people. And also like kind of like used to uh, uh, use the application more than mm -hmm. before. All right. Okay. Okay. Thank you for your answer. Anyone else? Um, I have to communicate with my college uh, via online channel only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, the use of digital technology no? online. All right. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rowena, so I can join you a question. I think that for me, I feel like uh, I feel more comfortable to stay home and work mm -hmm. at home because mm -hmm. it's more quiet. 
and I can have a more time to manage many things at the same time. So if uh, one day I have to go back to work as normal, so I think that I forgot my old habit now. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, may I? Going back to me, <laughs> Uh, may oh, yes, I, please. Mom Rowena? Thank you, Mom. Okay. Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm sure. also from the Philippines, and um, I've been teaching at Assumption University for many years now. Mm -hmm. Now, with this pandemic, I have come to enjoy um, more adventures with internet, and also mm -hmm. I have learned to to bake <laughs> and to cook. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, thank you for sharing. What What is your name, please? Mary. Mary. Yes, nice meeting you, Mary. Also okay, from nice the Philippines. You too. Yes. Yeah, any other answer? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rowena. I'm sure, but uh, I'm quite different from the Dr. Bun Anand a little bit because uh, <laughs> I have to work at home, but I have the longer time to work than I work at the office club. <laughs> Uh huh. Hmm. So you mean uh, you miss some hours of sleep because you're still working? <laughs> um, yes, something like that. Because uh, if we work at the office, uh, when uh, around uh, 18 o'clock, I can uh, close the computer and then the drive uh, come back home. But the when yes. we, we um, stay at home and work at home, cannot cross the notebook at the 18 o'clock, something like that. Yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, so you uh, don't find it relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike uh, Ajarn, uh, Professor Bunanan, you know, uh, on your side, it, it's a different scenario. Cup. Right, okay. Thank you for that. Any more answer? Uh, my name is Natawood. Uh, for me, for the living behavior, I share everything. Working, living, consum consuming, buying something, use technology, mm -hmm. or everything I shared it at this moment. Uh -huh. Because of our COVID-19, I cannot go to the office. Uh -huh. uh, Sometimes I need to close my factory. Uh, I need to change working behavior of all, uh, all my staff. Or also about the uh, eating, dining. Mm -hmm. I also need to order, use the technology, or sometimes change to cook. I think I change mm -hmm. everything, like <laughs> before the answer. <laughs> and All I'm right. still not familiar about this. Uh huh. Okay. Okay. So, Thank you. So a, a lot of changes, no, in in your lifestyle, even in your uh, work behavior, in your business, right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Any more answer? All right. So as for me, I can say that I have developed new values and habits as well. For one, I can say that I became more grateful for the present, you know, instead of being too anxious about the future, because I realized that life is too short. So instead of worrying so much about what lies ahead, you know, maybe five, ten years from now, I, I focus and I become more grateful about what is at the present moment. And another thing, I pick up gardening as a hobby. And I also uh, develop some um, digital uh, technological skills as a result also of uh, different uh, work arrangements. So yeah, I guess uh, all of us, one way or another, have had some changes in our behavior, in our habits, in our values and attitudes. This is Nico Flores. He's 23. He's a security guard in a condominium in Metro Manila, the Philippine capital. 
In this photo, he is polishing his mountain bike. This is his first bicycle, which he bought from borrowed money when public transportation was restricted in the Philippines because of the pandemic. And when the government lifted the lockdown, Nico started cycling to go to work. But now, Nico sees cycling not only as a logistical convenience, but also as a means of personal liberation to be able to explore places with his bicycle. And this is one of the many changes in human behavior during the pandemic, which may still stick even long after it has ended. Oh, why is it going? All right. No, I... All right. So the COVID-19 pandemic is so disruptive, so unexpected, that it changed human behavior significantly in the past 10, two years. The many months of changes to our routines may have led to changes in our behavior, in our traits and values. And this is true not only for the Filipinos, but practically for most, if not everyone in the world who have been affected by the world, by the health crisis. And that is why understanding these behavioral changes is extremely relevant to foster policies that are socially and behaviorally oriented. It is important that the government will consider this in drafting new policies and adjusting public services offering and how they offer them in order to meet these new changes. So for the next one hour, I will be sharing with you insights, observations, and study findings on the following topics. First, I will give you a brief overview about the nation's fight against the COVID-19 pandemic. And then I will move quickly to discussing the behavioral changes emerging from the impact of the crisis. And after this, I will discuss the possible implications of these changes on development and public service policies in the new normal. For this presentation, I ran a desktop research across a variety of sources consisting of scientific journals, conference papers, organizational websites, and newspaper articles. I also conducted a virtual focus group discussion with employees from seven different government agencies to know more about how the pandemic has impacted them and what matters to them right now. The first case of COVID-19 in the Philippines was recorded on January 30, 2020. This was 17 days after Thailand detected the first infection outside of China. And so right away, the Philippine government imposed what is now known as the longest and strictest lockdowns in the world. Under this lockdown, people below 21 years old and over 60 were not allowed to go out of their homes. Only one family member was allowed to go out in order to buy essential food and medicine. And there was a 10 p.m. to 5 a.m. curfew. All offices, transportation, and schools were closed. And this strict quarantine lasted across the country from March 15 to June 1. That was almost three months. And it has only been eased in some areas since then. The Filipinos had shown cooperation with government policies and adherence to restrictions. Studies suggest that despite limitations, Filipinos in general have 
stayed at home, worn their masks, and washed their hands. I don't know what's happening to my... <laughs> it's automatically going. Sorry for that. And because of these restrictions on movement and the closure of business operations, the pandemic brought significant impact on the household income. 38% claimed that their income is down by more than 50% on November 2021. In the same period, reports show that unemployment rate was at 6.5% or 3.16 million people. 16.7% was the unemployment rate or 7.62 million people. As of January 2022, the total COVID-19 cases ballooned to over 3.5 million. And of those 3.5 million, nearly 3.3 million had recovered and around 54,000 died. So there were so many deaths. Even I personally saw a lot of deaths among my relatives, my friends, neighborhood, and community. Now you might be asking, why is it that despite the strict lockdown, where there's still many infection cases and deaths? Well, just like many other governments, the current Philippine government is accused of mismanagement of the crisis. The hospitals were overloaded. There were inefficiencies in case finding and isolation, inefficiencies in contract tracing and quarantine procedures. There were inadequate and unsafe transportation options. There was growing inequity in society where the poor people were the most aggravated by pandemic and the complicated rules that make it difficult for the public to comply with safety protocols. Also, the government was accused of vaccine missteps, dropping the ball in the country's negotiations with the U.S. drug maker Pfizer. And this caused the delay of delivery of the much needed vaccine during the height of the health crisis. But it cannot also be discounted that this failure to address or manage the crisis could also be the effects of years of chronic underinvestment in health. In 1990 to 2007, the operating budget of the Department of Health had been largely flat at only 11 billion pesos per annum. So that is around 8 billion baht annually. And this only increased to 24 billion pesos in 2010. So we simply do not have what is necessary to combat the pandemic. With all these things happening within the past 18 months or so since the beginning of the pandemic. The Filipino public has gone through five forms of emotions. They felt anxiety, empathy, anger, hope, and boredom. I am sure that these emotions during the pandemic were not unique to Filipinos, but were felt by people across the globe who face the challenges and uncertainties. In the Philippines, the feeling of anxiety was caused by a number of factors, such as the government's handling of the pandemic, information or the changing and sometimes unreliable information on the virus, and the rising number of positive cases. 
A survey conducted by Ipsos on May 2020 among 500 Filipinos show that 94% express worry that they can contract COVID-19. Compared to the other countries surveyed, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, it was in the Philippines that most respondents expressed worry. In the midst of these challenges, the Filipino people have learnings, realizations, and habits, and learn to cope and adjust. And all these changes, learnings, are expected to guide their behavior post-pandemic. The crisis has created impact on different aspects of their lives in terms of attitudes and values, in terms of lifestyle, digital behavior, work behavior, and consumption behavior. One of the most obvious behavioral changes is the increased Bayanihan spirit and volunteerism. Bayanihan is a Filipino word which means solidarity, civic unity, and cooperation of the people. And I just want to check if you're still with me. Can you say that after me? Bayanihan. 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 All right. I think. Uh -huh. Bayanihan or bayanihan. So you, you pronounce that syllable by syllable so that it would be easier. So, yeah, bayanihan is, is part of Filipino culture. You know, it's very typical of the Filipino culture. It's about helping each other in times of crisis and emergency, be it earthquake, typhoon, volcanic eruption, flood. You know that, you know, all this... Um, natural catastrophes always visit the Philippines. But the pandemic is a different ballgame. It's, it's nothing that the Filipinos have experienced before. And I guess for most of us, or all of us, and during this pandemic, many Filipinos showed an even higher desire to help others with the various projects and acts of kindness going around. So there was increased volunteerism. Different sectors came together to volunteer their services and to provide funds. And volunteer work were done by students, youth, individuals, groups, NGOs, and business establishments. This photo on the right side shows a group of young volunteers that go out to the far-flung villages to bring learning materials to students and to help them with their studies. On the left side is one of the many community pantries that people set up to provide free food and groceries to those in need. The Filipinos have also demonstrated an even increased level of resilience and ingenuity. The Filipinos' attitude of resilience is the ability to pick themselves up in the face of disaster, to stop grieving, and to start their lives all over again. The so workplaces and even homes were transformed into spaces of discovery and innovation of creativity and resourcefulness. Ordinary people became creative and they learned new skills to hustle for a living. Because many people lost their jobs, they had to become more resourceful to use their talents in order to earn some money and put food on the table. The photos here show some of that 
ingenuity and resilience. On the right is the community farming model by the University of the Philippines, Los Baños, that urban settlers can adopt in coordination with their local governments, state universities, and other support groups. On the left is a social enterprise set up during the pandemic. This is a medicine delivery service that serves the older people, the vulnerable groups. And it also provides sustainable income to the partner youth riders and increases the revenue of local pharmacies. These are some of the ingenious projects and initiatives that started from the people's desire to get back to their feet amidst the pandemic. So you know that the Philippines is the largest Catholic nation in Asia, right? There's 92.5% Christian population in the country. And during the pandemic, the Filipino people became even more religious. Their faith in Christ takes precedence over the destructive force of the pandemic. It did not break the Filipino Christians, but instead it rejuvenates it all the more because their faith has given them reason to hope for a better tomorrow and to maintain their purpose in life. So you will see in this slide, in a survey conducted on September 2020, 51.8% of those who were surveyed have said that they became more religious. And even in the midst of the lockdown, even when churches were closed and religious gatherings were banned, the Filipinos have found ways in expressing their faith and unity. They attended online masses. They attended um, online fellowship gatherings and even prayed at home with their family or even alone. With the understanding that this pandemic might be causing other people difficulties and challenges, many have become more understanding and agreeable, displaying empathy and concern. They learn to understand the situation of other people, that each one's situation is unique. So they learn to treat others with gentleness and patience. And this type of attitude has been visible in the workplace, in communities, and even families. So when people were forced to stay inside their homes, they learned to value their family even more. This basic unit of society has become the primary support group for individuals to endure the challenges of the pandemic. And also, with too many deaths around, there was the realization that life is too short, just like what I, I mentioned to you in the beginning. So this made people want to live at the moment and to show love and gratitude to their loved ones. And they also learned to all take care of themselves. With movements restricted, social distancing and work from home arrangements, there was no option for people but to maximize the accessibility that digital technology has to offer. So I heard from most of your answers uh, in the beginning of this session that many of you really adopted digital behavior. And the same as in the Philippines, suddenly, there was a surge in the use of the digital technology in the country. Many government offices shifted to digital platform, including online appointment, online registration, and self-service 
paperless transactions. And so people learn to adopt to technology. And when I say people, it's both the government workers and the public they serve. So the employees, even the more senior, older staff, they learn to use MS Teams, hold Zoom meetings, use the internet. And despite initial resistance to change, the public also learned to access online services with the assistance of the agency and through online training. For example, many farmers realized the importance of investing on smartphones and learned how to use them to aid their farm work. And people started to trust and use online internet banking because the government channeled financial support to the marginalized sector using online banking technology. Even micro entrepreneurs like the store owners and sellers who were initially affected and displaced at the start of the pandemic, they eventually adopted and shifted to online platform. So now not only are they surviving, but they are even thriving during the pandemic. Due to the COVID quarantine and the decrease in medical services offered by health professionals during this period, people started to use telemedicine. This was also a big shift because um, of different factors, like Filipinos didn't have much access to telemedicine before, and also there was some doubt and skepticism on telemedicine because uh, people would want to see their doctors and talk to them face to face. But the pandemic forced them to shift to telemedicine and this aided in reducing health center occupancy and preventing the spread of the virus. The government um, partnered with telemedicine providers. And since then, almost 70,000 virtual session services had been provided to patients throughout the country. People felt a greater need to connect with others outside their home. I heard this also from one answer from you. So the connection with friends, with relatives and colleagues using social media applications. Aside from connecting to their circle, uh, people also became more social and willing to share their lives, their skills, their experiences and talents to the larger society using different social media platforms such as TikTok, you know, YouTube, Facebook, Social media technologies also afforded the older people who are living alone the opportunity to enhance their confidence on the use of technology in general. It facilitated their need to maintain social connectedness and inclusivity despite the distance and time boundaries. And aside from this, the older people also started to use social media technologies to access services, including e-health services. However, there was also a downside to it. It led to the rise of problematic internet use among the youth. For example, an aspect of internet addiction is problematic binge watching or gaming. Um, someone raised their hand? No. Okay. I thought someone raised their hand. All right. So, yeah, binge watching or gaming, which was linked to loss of control and also escapism and coping mechanism to manage emotional problems. So this was one of the downside of uh, too much using the internet 
which was also affected because of the pandemic. The crisis also drastically caused changes in the people's lifestyle in the Philippines. To protect themselves and others from the virus, the Filipino people adopted protective behavior that was prescribed by the government and the World Health Organization. So one survey shows that majority of the people who responded regularly clean their hands, use face masks, observe physical or social distancing, stay at home unless it's necessary to go out and avoid crowded places. Quarantine measures have forced people to stay inside their homes, leading to the new normal of living and adaptation. And one activity that has been very popular among Filipinos during the onset of the lockdown until the present time is the increased engagement in gardening. So home gardening suddenly became a widespread activity in rural and urban areas. So the use of the word plantito or plantita has become popular. It means someone who enjoys taking care of plants. So if you love, you know, gardening, and maybe I call you plantito or plantita. And studies show that the benefits of being a plant lover include stress relief, it improves mood, and also uh, it has taught people to be self-sufficient. So aside from home gardening, community farming has also become popular. And other hobbies such as fitness exercise, even at home, became popular as well as cooking, baking, and many others. Um, the survey by Google shows that uh, 35%, there was a 35% growth in search interest in exercise during the pandemic. When the government eased the lockdown, public transportation services was still limited. So for many people who don't have their own private cars, walking or cycling became the only means of getting to work. So many people became first time bike owners, just like the guy that I showed you in the first two slides, Nico. There was a bike boom, especially in Manila. Active travels increased and the use of public transport was reduced. Some people say they bike in order to reach their place of work or business. Others say it is to lead an active lifestyle. And many are doing for both reasons. The spending behavior of Filipino consumers has definitely changed because of the pandemic. With almost all households on a tight budget, the Filipino consumers are looking for products and services where they can get more value for their money. In one study, 79% expressed worry about their financial situation. So most households cut their spending on fast moving consumer goods in order to manage their budgets. And nowadays, brands don't matter as much as the quality and consumers get from what they are buying. And with the information available in one click, it is now easy for consumers to compare products and services with those others in the market. So the Filipinos demonstrated caution with their spending during this pandemic. Almost everything now is being sold and offered online, right? From food, clothing, medicine, plants, animals, 
to seminars, podcasts, consultations. And in just one click, you can have them delivered right to your doorstep. Now, not only are Filipinos shopping for clothes, footwear, and electronics in online stores, they are buying their groceries there too. That is a shift because before, Filipino people would not buy their groceries online. They want to touch, you know, <laughs> they want to touch to see the vegetable if it's fresh. Uh, they want to really go to the grocery store, you know, but the pandemic has forced them to just use online technology for that. And um, this can all, this was also helped by the phenomenal growth of e-payment platforms and mobile banking. And now people also prefer buying from home-based e-merchants, the small sellers, not only the big online retailers like Lazada or Shopee. And I will explain to you in a while why, why is that. The health crisis has prompted a more conscious intent and desire among Filipino local consumers to support local entrepreneurs. So more people are now buying locally made goods instead of imported ones in order to help drive the local economy. Before the pandemic, people used to buy vegetables and fruits from the big groceries. Now, they buy freshly harvested fruits from a sidewalk vendor. And even when buying clothing and footwear items, more people are patronizing the small and local business owners. And this can be attributed to the heightened sense of social responsibility of the people or the bayanihan. Bayan, the bayanihan spirit is also applicable here because they want to help, because they know that many people are struggling financially. So the bayanihan sense has been reinvigorated during this pandemic. In the face of the health crisis, the work behavior of people have been generally positive. The employees demonstrated a heightened level of dedication to their work, despite the danger of COVID-19. One study reported very high levels of work performance and career commitment during the pandemic time. Government employees, they demonstrated extra patience when dealing with the public to adjust to the situation. And because many of them serve the informal sector, they know that this informal sector um, lack knowledge and resources. So they learn to be more understanding and um, extended ex extra effort to attend to their needs. People also show changes in the ways they communicate and collaborate. There was intensified collaboration and partnership between Filipino researchers, scientists, academics, and practitioners. The local government units, which used to hoard information and compete with each other, they learned to share info and best practices on how to manage the pandemic. There was also the strengthening of public and private partnership. Because you know, historically, the relationship between the public and private sector in the country has been imperfect and at best transactional. Because both sides look at each other with doubts and skepticism. There were preconceptions that, you know, the private uh, vested interests and then the bureaucratic government processes seem unappealing. So this results in a lack of visibility 
of each other's capacity and potential for collaboration. However, with the pandemic, there has been more willingness to collaborate to address the most pressing needs. There were also a lot of multi-sectoral collaboration. You will see in this photo um, an example of a collaboration between the government and 28 public and private sector organizations to provide reliable and updated information on COVID-19 prevention. During the pandemic, the government workers felt that their agencies took good care of them. They were provided health support, such as online doctors to monitor their health, as well as monetary and non-monetary assistance. And all of these helped be moral and made them trust the government more and remain loyal to government work. The pandemic also saw an increased level of trust of the public to government agencies. According to one manager from a government bank, the public trust level to their agency increased because the people saw that they can deliver. They also learned to trust online banking and recognize the importance of banks for saving money. A qualitative study of over 200 employees in the Philippines shows that they demonstrated capability to cope with the changes and disruption of the pandemic. Their coping behaviors include task focus and social scoping, stress reduction and cognitive techniques, and learning and faith-oriented coping. Let me digest that to you. So task focus coping involves the respondents attending to work-related activities at home, focusing on individual goals, simulating the work setting, and observing a regular routine similar to before. So this is being able to achieve the tasks even in the midst of all these changes in work arrangements and um, technology. Stress management involves a variety of enjoyable activities to cope and alleviate stress, such as gardening, practicing creative skills, um, exercising, watching videos online, etc. Social coping is about nurturing relationships with others by staying connected to family and friends, even via online. And social coping also extends to the greater community by providing help in terms of donation and volunteering. Cognitive strategies include acceptance, being flexible, and focusing attention. For employees, acceptance involves acknowledging that this pandemic is a huge phase where everything will change and that circumstances are beyond their control. It also involves adjustment in the situation into the changes that need to be done once this is over. Another coping strategy that the respondents mentioned is engaging in learning and development activities to further their knowledge and skills and promote personal or professional development. So this includes continuing education, attending webinars, reading news, and studies about COVID-19 to be more informed. Faith-oriented coping is another coping behavior displayed by respondents. Spiritual coping mechanisms such as spending more time in prayer and attending church online were also reported. 
But of course, there were also unhelpful and unhealthy coping strategies reported by individuals, including drinking and smoking. This table shows the employee's coping mechanisms as discussed. And on the right here, you will see the organization's initiatives to mitigate the impact of crisis. It appears that individual level actions were shaped or were influenced by the responses of the organization within which the person is part of. Let's see, for example, organizations have implemented changes in their work arrangements that made it possible for employees to work remotely through digital platform. And so they were able to um, also engage in other relaxing activities to manage their stress and to also to connect with other people. So as seen in these results, the policy on flexible work arrangement and material financial support enabled employees to deal effectively with the crisis, right? So given this, organizations need to touch base with employees in order to gain more insights into their needs, concerns, and coping behaviors. And at the same time, employees need to openly communicate their needs and suggestions to the organization. So the following slides that I will be showing summarize the impact of the pandemic on human behavior. On attitudes and values, the Filipinos have shown increased by enhanced spirit and volunteerism, increased ingenuity and resilience, becoming more religious during the pandemic, becoming more agreeable and patient with one another, and forging closer relationship with family. On digital behavior, there was an increased digital adoption, increased use of telemedicine, and increased social connectedness using the internet. On lifestyle, there was the adoption of protective behavior, adoption of active travel, and adoption of new hobbies. On spending behavior, the Filipino people have become more cautious with their spending, more consumers supporting local and small brands, and there was a big shift to the online platform. On work behavior, there was a heightened level of commitment and dedication to work. More willingness to collaborate and share information. An increased level of trust and confidence in government. All right, let me just have a drink of water and catch my breath. Are you still there with me? Yes. 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 All right. Good. So let us continue. As I mentioned in the beginning, I conducted a focus group discussion just for this presentation. Okay. I talked to uh, representatives of seven different government agencies in the Philippines. And the participants shared about their experiences and the changes in their perspectives, behavior, and attitudes during the pandemic. These thematic findings show some positives from the COVID-19 virus situation. And I call this the pandemic silver linings. So first, the respondents 
actually consider the lockdown as a welcome change to take a break from work and spend more time with family. Because pre-pandemic, the workload was high. So the lockdown was a welcome change. They spent the lockdown period to take a break and to bond with family. They learned also to do new things and to adapt to changes in the workplace. Of course, initially they said that they struggled with the changes and adjustments with the work shifting, the adoption of digital platform in providing services, the work from home setup, learning new technology. These are all new. But after a few months, they were able to adopt and to learn new things. They also said that pre-pandemic, work was kind of, you know, routinary. And this crisis provided opportunity for them to be creative, to be innovative and flexible. The respondents also said that they became more patient and understanding with the clients they serve because many people still did not know how to use the digital platform. So the employees had to extend extra effort to assist their clients. So they became uh, more um, accommodating. Another is that they learned to value the importance of working in the government sector. Because before they said that they did not take much pride in their work. But in this pandemic, they learned and realized the value of working in the government. This is because while many people working in private organizations lost their work or had their salaries cut, the government workers felt secured with the stability of their jobs and their salaries. There was also better coordination and increased productivity at work. The pandemic brought a sense of urgency to government workers. Maybe because they were, before they were sabay-sabay, you know? But with the pandemic, they had to deliver because the new work arrangement was by shifting. So employees needed to deliver quality work within the set time. So they pick up habits that help them become more efficient and productive at work. They also develop better coordination with their colleagues to manage the workloads and client expectations. And lastly, another silver lining is having better access to national office with technology. The respondents said that pre-pandemic, the provincial offices did not have direct access to national office. The national office would only send representatives to visit them from time to time. But with the pandemic and using digital technology, you know, Zoom meetings, the provincial office could interact with the national officials more frequently. They had direct access to them and that somehow also boost their morale. So these are the pandemic silver linings that um, the respondents uh, in the FGD uh, raised during the discussion. And so I asked them, post-pandemic, what would stick? The psychologist Maxwell Maltz theorized that it takes 21 days for a particular course of action to turn into a habit. And if this habit is practiced for 66 days, it becomes an automatic response. And if such a response is practiced for 180 days, it becomes part of one's character. And we are now, what, 
260 days in quarantine, right? So it is safe to say that the changes, maybe if not all, some of them, the changes in our preferences and values and actions, the way we behave, are now deeply etched in our character. So in the FGD discussion, when asked what would stick to them after the pandemic, they said that they think the positive attitudes and values they pick up in the past two years would stick. The value of patience and understanding, the value of family, value of life, value of government work, adaptability to changes, and the importance of digital technology. And what would not stick? The FGD participants believe that not all public services can be digitized especially those that need personal interaction with people. And even if it's possible to be fully digitized, the participants said that some people would still prefer to interact with staff face-to-face. -face. So according to them, it could be a hybrid service for many of these agencies post-pandemic. So moving forward, these evolving truths can inform the strategies, policies, and processes of government agencies to better serve the public in the new normal. So first, the LGUs or, or local government units can use volunteerism as part of their development strategy. People empowerment programs where they engage the active participation of their citizens, leading to increased trust in the government. Next, as the people become more comfortable and adept with digital technology, the government can push the digitalization of public services where applicable. It should upgrade digital infrastructure to support this. Because you know, The Philippines has been lagging behind its neighbors in embracing digital technology. But with the right support, this may now be the right time to catch up, particularly in digital banking, digital payment, and self-service transactions. The government can also look at enhancing the older adults' technological competency and also to look into how to mitigate the problematic internet use among young people. Another is that the government can leverage on the public trust and confidence to introduce new initiatives and um, projects that used to face resistance. And to make sure that it is ready to face another pandemic if it happens. The initiatives, projects, and budget allocation on public health and well-being should dominate government's priorities. On mobility, the policies for mobility need to take into consideration changes in people's attitudes, social norms, their perceptions and habits surrounding mobility. So the government um, can give attention to building infrastructure and use new technologies to support active transportation and help develop the biking culture in the country. Another, the learnings from the success of PPP public-private partnerships should be carried on. The potential for complementarity should be kept in mind and translated into actions in all the reform endeavors of the government. Another, the government can use this opportunity to 
strengthen the capability of the government. To repair those. Okay, so. All right. Okay, I'll continue. So I'm talking about um, using this opportunity from the pandemic to strengthen the capability of the government workforce, to train them, to equip them with knowledge and skills on how to respond to crises and emergencies so that if another pandemic happens, they will be ready. They will be more ready. And lastly, this may look you know, um, trivial or small, but the government can also look at possible opportunities to incorporate gardening in communities. Uh, to encourage uh, sustainability and self-sufficiency. All right, so that is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, we can now proceed to question and answer. And if you want to share how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the behavior of people in your respective countries, please feel free to share. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rowena, for sharing knowledge with us. And before we move to Q&A question part, uh, let me brief what Dr. Rowena shared to us today. So at first, yeah, we discussed about a new habit during the pandemic, right? And then uh, we tried to see like what might stick, uh, stick to us after uh, the pandemic end. And we look into Philippines that like uh, how the nation fight the pandemic. Like it got like uh, some mismanagement, some uh, misstep of vaccine. And this all uh, with the pandemic can lead to the uh, worry of the uh, of the uh, people. And then it lead to the like behavior change uh, that uh, come from like the chain of attitude and value. And also the uh, digital behavior that change and also the work uh, behavior that change. And we also look into like uh, the implement the implementation on government strategy and policy for uh, development in the new normal. And we can see that um, uh, anal we, we can analyze the strategy and then see uh, how uh, the strategy can be developed and also like um, to be prepared for the other pandemic that might come. Uh, and to be able to be more ready to to handle it. So, uh, okay, from now on we move to Q&A and we have a 30 minute to spare for this part. So if you have any question, please feel free to ask Dr. Rowena. Yes. That was a very good summary, thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone uh, have question? All right. Uh, uh, okay. Okay, uh, I'm not good. I would like to uh, ask you for the first questions. As for the 1st of July, Thailand will announce the COVID from pandemic to a epidemic disease, right? Or uh, for the transit, Transit, uh, transit time. What should uh, what Philippines do from the pandemic to the normal disease for the country? Something like that. What what is the management strategy that uh, Philippines do? Uh, uh, mic microphone, please. <laughs> You mean for transitioning from pandemic to endemic? Yes, yes, that's that right. Yeah. Um, I, from the news and from the information that I receive, I understand that the government is uh, still strengthening its vaccination campaign. And uh, that includes the booster. So even from the province where I came from, they already achieved 100% uh, 
vaccination. So that's that's the campaign that the government is doing, uh, strengthening the the vaccination. Um, they are already opening the schools, although it's not yet uh, full, but there are pilot schools that are allowed to open. So slowly, although you will see that it's now election time in the Philippines, you know, and uh, campaigning, political campaigning is in full force. So when you look at uh, maybe news on the internet or television, you wouldn't think that the Philippines has, it actually has not been fully announced that it has transitioned. But people are already allowed outside. People are already allowed to gather. But I think it's also in the consciousness of uh, them that they should still try to protect themselves and others. So you will see them still um, wearing masks and still uh, observing the safety protocols. OK, uh, am I right that uh, the trans is uh, is depend on the vaccine number of people, vaccine percents, a hundred percent. So trans is to the another step, right? Right, right. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Davajadavina, I've got several questions, but I would go with the first question first, just to make sure that uh, we have some enough uh, enough time for the others. Um, <laughs> As you all know, um, the Philippines is one of the biggest earners of uh, revenues from remittances. And better power in the pandemic, that would actually cause some disruptions in international trade, international transactions, or whatever. So how has the pandemic affected uh, the stream of, of remittances coming into the Philippines? Even remittances. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes, it has really impacted actually the many of uh, overseas Filipino workers who are the sources of remittances from abroad. So from Thailand alone, there are many Filipinos who had to go back to the country because they lost their jobs. Um, even in the Middle East, in, in Europe, uh, they were affected, they lost their jobs, and so they had to go back home. And of course, that has uh, negatively affected the remittances. Thank you. I don't have the numbers uh, on how much was the uh, reduction in the remittances, but um, considering all this repatriation of Filipinos, uh, I believe that it is relational. And not only the OFWs or overseas Filipino workers who are land-based, but also the sea-based. Because many Filipinos are working in uh, cruises, right? Uh, they are also working in big um, carriers. And these were put on hold. And so many uh, seafarers uh, had to go back home. So yeah, that, that's also a, a, a big negative impact to the Philippine economy. Thank you. Uh, if there are no other questions that I, I, I might as well go on with the, the second question. I'm quite delighted to have learned that uh, during your presentation, though, you mentioned that teachers, the Filipinos teachers, have very high level of work performance, etc. So we have um, not detected, we have been able to identify some positive uh, trend in the Philippines, um, uh, this way, uh, public service sector's performance, uh, performance within um, the Filipinos public sector. And that is a sort of benchmark we can use um, for comparison purposes with other countries. But uh, um, how how certain we are with with this uh, with this with this measurement of this with this um, 
uh, analysis show that um, the system, the public sector in the Philippines has become quite uh, resilient and adapted to, to, them, to the situation. And that would, serve as, that would definitely serve as the backbone for further development, stepping, stepping stone for further development. And if that's the case, then I'm, I'm quite delighted. And that should be actually a case uh, study for international comparisons, really. Thank you. All right. So um, what, what was the question again? Um, could we have some sort of uh, rigid academic analysis for um, the Philippines public sector's performance, uh, which can be used as, um, what shall I say, as, as a project study for international comparison, because we have been able to identify with, um, in your presentation, seems that we have been able to identify uh, some positive development within just say one or two years, for example, starting to uh, Cape and Bangkok, etc. For example, so how can we um, uh, use all these sources to make sure that we can, uh, you know, compare the Philippine cases with um, international uh, counterparts, for example? Because uh, mm -hmm. in countries, it seems that we have seen some disruptions in the public sector performance within the, the public sectors um, as such. Mm. You mean you're asking if there's a rigid academic research of private sector during uh, the pandemic? Public sector, private sector, whatever, whichever, because that should, should be used as a, and it can be a benchmark for international comparisons. Because in some other parts of the world, for example, we have identified both positive and negative, uh, positive developments and negative drawbacks. Uh, uh, on account of um, the pandemic, for example, within the public sector, the private sector, et cetera. Yeah, actually, uh, from the desktop research that I conducted, there are a number of uh, uh, research studies on uh, the impact of the pandemic on education, on the education sector and uh, the business sector. So basically, it's all about looking at both the uh, positive and negative impact of the pandemic. So I can uh, give you the some of uh, the sources. Um, and yeah, that is a good uh, suggestion for you if there can be like a comparative study on how different countries, you know, um, adjusted to the pandemic in different sectors. I haven't seen something like that, a comparative study uh, between countries. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. So I think we have uh, time for one more small, small question. Is there anyone who want to ask the last question? Or if someone can share also, I understand how many nationalities do we have here? We have, of course, from Thailand, um, Nepal, or all from Thailand. Yeah, would someone want to share also? Like, how was it or was it? too different or was it similar with the Philippine experience? Mm -hmm. Right. We have uh, still have a little bit time. If uh, any student have a more question, Rowena will be happy to answer it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yes. Well, if uh, no one have question, then I have a question for you. <laughs> Hi, yes. Sir. OK, Professor. yes, because uh, your topic is uh, very current and is a fit to the present situation, including the future also. And I have to let you know that uh, majority of uh, this group, they are 
uh, currently studying the first year and the second year student in the PhD program. Mm -hmm. So let's say if they looking for the dissertation topics, can you give us some ideas that uh, what uh, they would like to do because uh, we having three majors mm -hmm. in the PhD Thai program. The first major is in policy, the second major in HR, and the third one is in the public and private sector. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I This comparative study is always, you know, more difficult than single country study, right? But it's also very challenging. Um, one, I, I would like to like, uh, once the other, the student who mentioned about comparative study, that is one thing that uh, you can consider, a comparative study on the COVID-19 responses in, let's say, in the manufacturing sector between countries so and so. But that's that's a huge study. That is when you have time. Now, if you don't have time, you can just maybe focus on, you know, uh, examining the um, COVID-19 response or uh, emergency response of uh, the private sector in, in one place. The response and also you could also try to look use the crisis in context theory. Uh, the study that I presented to you earlier about the response of employees is related to the response of the organization using the crisis in context theory. So I think that is very relevant as well. Uh, you would want to know if it's really related, how the employees response, respond to crisis is related to how the employees, uh, you know, uh, the organization um, provide for their needs or address their needs. So that's uh, relational. Uh, you may also look at a bigger context because it's an ecological framework for understanding uh, human behavior. So aside from organizational um, response, you can look, look at a larger environment. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so now it's time. So as we bring uh, our seminar to a close, so uh, we would like to thank you, Dr. Rowena and Dr. Bun Anand for providing this good seminar. And once again, thanks all of the audience. And I hope that this activity will have like has given you a much greater understanding of the issue. And before we, we part, let me introduce another interesting online seminar that Dr. Rowena also will be with us as guest speaker today. Uh, so let me share. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this seminar, uh, uh, the online seminar, how to conduct the research and publish in Scopus Journal. Uh, as I mentioned before that uh, Dr. Rowena experience in publishing academic publication in Scopus and various uh, academic publication. And she also published the book names like When Stories, Teach, Learning and Teaching, The Art of Case Writing. And if you are interested in how to conduct the research and public in Scopus Journal, you, you can register uh, through QR codes on the screen. The online uh, seminar will be like um, on 23rd uh, April uh, from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, through Microsoft Team program. Yes. And so I think that's it for today. So after this, before we part, uh, can you please turn on like a video so hey, the, the camera so we can take a photo to each other? Please everyone turn on your camera. I would like to take pictures. 
<laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Yes. Shall we smile now? Uh -huh. okay. Yes. Thank you very much, and see you next time, Dr. Rowena and everyone. Good night. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.